Thanks for uh, being here. Um, I, I'm Andrew Hamilton, and this is uh, Andrea Sansone. And uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. And we uh, will basically, we're asked to come talk to you guys, and we've got this presentation we've kind of done, and it's sort of the ideas, it's about like, you know, how to go about planning and achieving, you know, your big mountain goals or fastest known time goals, and, and so, so anyway, that's what, what it's about. We're just make it through really long, um, hard things, so whatever that's going to be for you, too, so... So we'll start it off. So this year, Andrea set this, uh, you know, Nolan's 14 uh, record. She set the, the women's fastest time, and it was a ridiculous time, actually. I mean, the men's time is really good, but so her time was the second fastest time overall. And anyway, so we've got this video we'd like to show you first that our friend made for us. Our bodies are so capable of doing really hard things, and if our mind says that we can do it, our body will follow. If our mind shuts down, then our body's going to shut down. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, it'd be nice if I didn't go up there. But she is a little, little nervous about that, but it's really not that bad, babe. Yeah. How are I'm you sure following the track on a, on a phone? Yeah. I'm sure. Nolan's is a link up of 14 14ers. The hard thing about Nolan's is that you're linking up all of these mountains on foot. The Sawatch holds some of the tallest 14ers in the state. The terrain is so variable and trying just to figure out how to link these mountains up in the most efficient way, I think that's what makes this the most challenging. I don't feel like I'm prepared to take on this challenge. After the 24 hour record, I thought I was done for the summer. And here we are five weeks later and I'm going out for Nolan's this weekend. If I feel good and I'm having good climbing times, then I'm happy. Really, it, that's just all there is to it. If I'm feeling all this pressure, I have to do well to be happy. Fun day out in the mountains. It's a fun day out. Last track road. Almost the summit there. Uh, Andrea and Dan came in, so Dan did Princeton with her, and he's looking pretty beat. He said she's moving fast, so that's good. I hope, hope hopefully she's not moving too fast. An hour 45 ahead of my yeah. I don't know how I'm doing this. Just do this. Let's do it. <laughs> and then we gotta rock the night, huh? Yeah. I feel like shit. Yeah, let's go, Andrea! Woo! Woo! Let's go! You are so close. You are crushing it. Yeah, one more. Thank you. Wow. That was not <laughs> any of my doing, but all of ours, you know?
is that? Brings back some memories. Some good, some not so good. <laughs> it's really sad because there's a lot of pain that got missed in that video. Yeah, basically, so we call this uh, Pursuing Summits and Pushing the Limits. And uh, so basically, yeah, you're going to learn all of our secrets in here, all right? So if you got any big adventures planned, you definitely want to pay attention. <laughs> I mean, or, or not, you know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, if you have any questions, feel free. You know, we love talking to people. And, um, you know, we have actually, we were going to put that up there, but, but we're A2 Summit on Instagram or just look us up. You know, you find our number, but contact her because she's the one that actually will respond. <laughs> um, so, uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah, so let's get into it. So basically, oh yeah, we were just going to sort of give some introductions to ourselves. And, and so for me, you know, I grew up in Salt Lake City. You know, I still remember like there was this one day, well, so my parents were divorced and I lived in Cortez, which is in Colorado. And, and uh, so my stepdad one day, he's like, let's go climb a mountain. And so he chose La Plata, or in the La Plata's down near Durango, the highest peak is called Mount Hesperus. And so he just took me up there. I was 11. And we actually had a pretty ridiculous, you know, adventure coming down this ice gully, and then I fell down this snow field. But, uh, you know, but he had a great time, and he was like, you know, hey, we're going to start climbing all the 14ers. And that was kind of how I got, got into 14ers. And, um, and then, you know, I went to, to uh, CU Boulder for school, and, and uh, you know, I became a raft guide at one point, too, where I was by all the mountains. Um, but anyway, now I've, I'm 48 years old, and I've got four kids, and I live in Golden. All right, and uh, my name's Andrea. Uh, I'm a nurse. I work at Children's Hospital Colorado, and I'm 34. I grew up in Pennsylvania, moved to Florida for two years to get nursing experience, and for a short while I lived in California, and then I moved out here in 2013, uh, and now we're living together in Golden. Uh, we're going to talk about our athletic progression. We don't, we're not born into and athletic, you know, ability per se, you have to work for it, so. Um. All right, so for me, you know, I, I, I remember I was working on the river in Buena Vista, and I, they had just come out with this new guidebook for the 14ers, it was Roach's first edition. And, uh, you know, the guidebook before that, I still remember my, my stepdad cursing, like, Lampert and Bornman, you know, ah! You know, because we'd always be lost out there. And they have, like, you know, one description per mountain. And so when Roach's book came out, and it was, like, all these different routes and good descriptions and maps, it was really cool. And at the beginning, he had this description of the 14er record, which was something like 16 days at the time, which is, you know, how long can you do all the four, or, how, you know, how fast can you do all the 14ers? And I started just thinking, wouldn't it be cool to do all the 14ers in 14 days? That was just like, I thought that would be really cool. So I started thinking about that. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and anyway, so that was kind of like part of it. And then, and then, so I went and did that record. And it was actually this, you know, it was amazing for me. It was, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was just a kid, 24 years old. And, um, and somehow, through all this adversity, I persevered and made it to the end. And uh, just that whole experience gave me, I don't know, it just changed me. It gave me, uh, I didn't, you know, a lot of like self-confidence that I could do stuff. And, uh, you know, so then after that, I got into like mountain bike racing and stuff. And one of the other experiences I had was, um, you know, I w I've never been the best, like fastest mountain bike racer. I don't really love technical stuff too much. Uh, but I would just, you know, I signed up for the 24 hour race and middle of the pack and then it got night. And by the time morning came, most of the people had just dropped out. And so somehow I was like there at the front. And so it sort of just helped me develop this philosophy of where, you know, kind of like, you know, the tortoise and the hare, right? You can, you can go slow and if you just keep going, you can do, do good, good things, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then, you know, later on, you know, I got into adventure racing, which is a great sport, but I, you know, I think it's kind of, I don't see it around too much anymore, which helped me develop like, you know, doing stuff at nighttime. And then I started hiking um, the 14ers with all my kids. And then I met Andrea, basically. And that's an athletic feat in and of itself, hiking with kids. <laughs> yeah. It's a different topic for another day. Um, <laughs> so I considered myself athletic growing up. I was involved in an athletic family. Um, I did all of the individual sports. I did gymnastics, pole vaulting, diving. Um, and so that was all high school. Um, and then in college, I kind of quit sports altogether uh, to focus on school. And I just did things to stay fit. So I really got to know the gym well and the treadmill well. Um, and then in 2010, I came out to Colorado 
uh, with a group and I ended up hiking Mount Harvard. That was my very first 14er. And then um, I came back in 2012 when I was living in Florida and did a few other mountains and then met Andrew on South Maroon and that was my fifth 14er. Um, and we met at the summit and he asked me and my friend to go across the traverse and I thought that was a great idea. I didn't even know what a traverse was. I was, I was actually really horrified because you know at that point I've already done the 14er record and stuff and I just can't believe somebody would do South Maroon and not North Maroon. Like, are you kidding me? If you've done that and you don't do that, you've done nothing because you have to come back up here. So we convinced, you know, our, our group, we convinced and we're like, oh, we've got all the ropes and stuff because we've got the kids, so just come with us. And, and so that was how it all started. I was started. like, great, can we be back? Because we have to yeah. babysit tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so uh, that was that. And then uh, when I moved here in 2013, Andrew and I really started uh, training together. Um, he was got really interested in the 14er record when he met me. And so that was in 2015 when he did that record and so kind of leading up to that in 2014 we started training together and doing some big days and in 2015 there was talk of nolans and hey what's this nolans thing and so that kind of planted the seed into me for what it what is it like to do something really big and to have really big days and to be mentally tough and to suffer what does that look like and when i kind of found a little bit of that i liked it um i didn't like it while you're doing it but it's the aftermath that kind of you forget the pain and you're always drawn back to those really big days because they're very rewarding um you find out a lot about yourself and who you are and um so that's kind of you know andrew really took me under his wing and taught me so much um about the outdoors in the mountains so I really credit my ability to him. And I've created a monster, basically. <laughs> She's terrifying. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, anyway, I'll like, move on. Like, oh, see, so. Here, just look behind you. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, 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 OK. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so if, you, if you don't know what an FKT is, it stands for fastest known time. And so, you know, they've really kind of taken off in recent years. In fact, the F Fastest on Time website just recently got by Outside Magazine. And so I don't know what they're doing with it. But now you look on there, there used to be just a few routes. And now there's like hundreds of routes all over the world. So it's, it's, uh, there's some pretty ridiculous athletes that go for stuff like this. But a lot of the best routes are still in Colorado, you know, in my opinion, obviously biased. Um, but uh, so, so anyway, you know, we just like to do them. You know, honestly, we just love these big challenges. And, you know, there's a term I don't know if you're familiar with, um, probably some of you, but like it's called type two fun you know that's like so there's type one fun that's just something that's just fun like i don't know what's an example like i don't know i don't know i don't know a kid you're sliding down the slide that's fun <laughs> Wee, you know but type two fun you don't think it's fun at the time in fact you hate it and then you look back later and you're like wow that was amazing that was so fun you know and that's kind of what we do <laughs> yeah but you hate it while, while you're doing it but uh but anyway i mean just you know for us it's sort of we just look, look forward and that's you know what gets us excited you know we look at these big challenges and it's like oh you know like you know for us that's our vacations you know it's like oh what's some big mountain link up we can go do that we've never heard of or something so for example like this year we're hoping we might get to get out and, and see like all the wyoming 13ers which we think would be really cool you know so but we yeah. never, normally wouldn't have enough time to do that you know and we wouldn't really know what they were about if we didn't have the fkt site because we've seen hey someone's done the wyoming 13ers in such and such amount of time and we're like well, let's go check that out um, we're definitely goal-oriented people. That's our drive. Um, it keeps us going through the year. It keeps us going through the winter. We're not, we don't love winter. Um, we just get through it. And so um, it's kind of really, we don't like to wish away winter, but um, we kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this was just sort of showing, you know, one of, one of one thing Andrea is amazing about is, I mean, especially when I first met her was, well, even now, now too, like, is like, she loves helping people finish their 14ers. And so she's finished so many with so many different people. And like, she'd spend her whole summer just doing mountains with people. And so anyway, this is just some, some example of some of our friends that we've taken up. And we, uh, those we are use, actually the, the same, same candles. candles. Yeah, we use over and over. <laughs> but we always like, like lug a big cake up there. Actually, it's kind of funny. That middle that, one is the most I carried impressive. that one. That one didn't do so well on Capitol. <laughs> but when Andrea carries them up, usually they're pristine at the top. <laughs> Oh yeah, and so then we're going to talk about some of the adventures we've done. So you know, for me, of course, like I mentioned, the, the first one was the um, the Colorado 14er speed record in 1999. Um, you know, so like I said, that was a great experience for me. But uh, you know, that record. I mean, the thing about these records is 
they get broken really quickly because there's a lot of other amazing athletes, you know, that, that, that are out there. And, uh, and so anyway, the next year that got broken and this guy known as Cave Dog set the record and he put it at this ridiculous level. You know, I had squeaked under 14 days and then he came the next year and did it and took three days after that time. And it was everything I could have mustered at the time. So I was like, well, maybe I'll move on to something else now. And, uh, and so after that, I tried, you know, at the time, I really liked biking better anyway. And, and so I did um, where, I, you know, you bike between all the 14ers. And so that was like kind of an adventure for a while. And then, you know, in 2014, we kind of like started noticing Nolans. You know, Nolans had been around for a long time. And, uh, but I'd never been interested in Nolans because it seemed so, it, it seemed wimpy to me, you know, because I was used to like the whole 14er record. And as you can see, what's yeah. a summer without Nolans, you guys? <laughs> 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 so, so yeah, but then I, I really started liking Nolans and it was just such a challenge to always like try to perfect that route. You know, you can always like, you know, try to shave a few, few minutes off here. In fact, Wade Gardner sitting in the front here, you know, he, uh, we had talked a few years ago, he's finished Nolan's and he was telling me, because I had forgotten who told me about this one great shortcut that we take now. And now everybody knows about that shortcut, but I mean, it's, it's this brilliant shortcut. I can't believe we weren't all doing it. It seems so obvious, but, mm. but anyway, that's part of the fun for me is always trying to like perfect the route and do better. And, and, and better, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and uh, one of our first adventures was the California 14ers. And um, that happened to be an FKT. Really, it was just we were out there on a backpacking trip. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was an FKT for Andrea just because um, no women had really done it that fast. The, men, the men's time is this pretty disgusting time because they're, they're really technical peaks. And, uh, it's like two but, days. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but that kind of blew our mind as to how different it is out there because you know in colorado we benefit from a lot of like old mining roads and stuff like that that gives us good access to the peaks in california there was like none of that and so your access is really far away so you're climbing like you know a long ways to get up there so in, anyway so we love california and uh man there's some great routes here too like like the centennial elks traverse is one of my favorites that's where we do all the elks in one big push but you also throw in the centennials that are there. There's only three of them, but it makes you do these extra amazing traverses, mm -hmm. like you know, cathedral mm -hmm. to castle and the, the pyramid traverse and stuff like that. So we love that one. Basin. Oh, Chicago Basin 14ers. Oh yeah, and oh, I don't see the uh, oh the women who wipe out. That's also one of our favorite ones, which is mm -hmm. so the women who wilderness, which is sort of down in near Durango. And uh, it's, those are the 14ers you take the train to, but that area is called the Weminuch Wilderness, and there's some amazing 13ers down there, and so we call it the Weminuch Wipeout because you either wipe them out or they wipe you out. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's an amazing adventure, if anyone ever was looking for a good, a good trip to do where you don't want to see anybody. And, uh, and then this year, this was really Andrea's year, or I should say 2022, and uh, she started, you know, she broke her foot, and, uh, you know, so she was just sort of trying to figure out what to do. And then she came down and she just decided to do the incline. And somehow she was able to do 19 laps in a day. And really, she was just, you know, planning on doing like 16. So it was kind of ridiculous that she did that good. It, but it was a, I mean, so and it set this tone for the year. You know, she did so well there. And, uh, and so then she went for this thing that I'd, I'd been looking at this for years. But it was like, how many 14 years can you climb in one day? And, the, and at that time, it, you know, it, it was 11, and this guy, Eric Lee, was the guy that did it, and he's a super fast mountain runner, and uh, you look at some of his times, and it was like, man, that guy can move. Like, he would get Evans and Bierstadt done in two hours and 54 minutes. Yeah. That's just so fast. And, uh, you know, and that's following the 3,000-foot rule. And so it was like, how do you beat a guy like that? Well, fortunately, we were able to be really, you know, like we were able to really strategically plan out. And we actually started with Harvard and Columbia. And we went and Andrea really practiced these routes. And so she was able to get 12 done in one day. And actually, if we really thought she could have got 12, we probably could have gotten a 13th. You know? yeah. and, uh, and so then, and that sort of set her up for Nolan's this year, which was yeah. kind of like, the really big one because you know on that FKT website Nolan's is considered one of the premier routes in the whole world and so if you do well on that one you know then you know a lot of people notice and so for her to get that time there was pretty spectacular so this was really a good year for Andrea so and then we just have this page it's sort of like you know it's sort of like our you know for beginners you know yeah. so if you're someone just getting started yeah so just real quick um, we have a lot of people also talking to us about getting started. So we usually recommend just staying easy, one to, uh, class one and two 14ers. 14ers.com, I'm sure you have heard of it, um, really has a lot of great information on there. So we always tell people, just start with the easy ones, front range, um, 10 mile, 
uh, mosquito. So and set attainable goals. Make sure it's attainable or you're, you're going to fail. You know, you're just going to disappoint yourself. And finding a mentor, someone with greater experience, um, doing your own research and asking the right questions for sure. Um, if you want to be out in the mountains, we always suggest to get a tracker and know how to use it. Uh, trackers are great because you can communicate with other people tracker to tracker or text out, um, text other people and you can really track all your routes on there. So you'll have your whole history of everything that you've ever done in that brain of the tracker and so we really love our tracker Andrew has thousands of routes on when you open up Colorado and if I leave the filters off it looks like spaghetti yeah it's, 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 it's really pretty funny. amazing yeah. so and then we love search and rescue so we always suggest to buy a SAR card um, okay now we're going to kind of get into the bulk of our presentation and what we're going to talk about um, so just there's a lot of factors con to consider when you do um, hard things big things and uh, things a multi-day adventures um, and there's basically fitness logistics mental components and then there's a luck factor um, and so depending on what you're doing the size of these bubbles really change I tried to I, I grouped those three together because those are like the things you can control and like the other bubbles that like you can't really control you know the whole luck thing and uh, so, so anyway, and, the, and you can break the, each of these three things down, the whole fitness, logistics, and mental down. So that's, you know, what we're going to do basically for the rest of this presentation is talk about like lots of that stuff. But anyway, I wanted to give an example, you know, so a, a few years ago, I climbed all the 14ers in winter and I really felt like luck was really important that time. So, you know, it's like, you know, you just can't, like the weather is so important in winter. So, you know, depending on what you're doing, there's different factors that they can make a difference. And then in no one's, you know, it, it also depends on, on like, you know, the athlete themselves. Like some athletes are super fast and in in, 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 so that's actually a big strength for them. So they probably don't have to worry about that component as, as much, but they might need to focus more on the logistics or, or the mental component. You know, so all these factors are really important things to think about. And if you're weak in one, then that's the things you should be focusing on, mm -hmm. you know? So, and, uh, oh, oh yeah, the Nolans one, I was thinking maybe I screwed that up a little bit. Nolans has a little more mental. I made the mental small on that one, but I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so I guess, so we'll talk about so, sort of the fitness one and, and, uh, and, and training, you know? So obviously the fitness is an obvious component, you know, you got to train. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. so anyway, oh, there you go. Um, so our training goes in phases. Um, so we do uh, maintenance mode and that's really the winter months. We're just trying to maintain our fitness, maintain a base. So then when we start to build our fitness, we'll be ready for our peak in the summertime. Um, and so our maintenance mode uh, is really uh, kind of where we gain some weight and we're doing inside workouts because it's snowing. Sometimes we'll get out, do some winter sports. Um, and then our building phases probably comes in April and May, uh, maybe the end of March. Um, and then we have uh, our peak phase. And so that's probably three months of the summer where we're going for the FKTs, going for our goals and trying to achieve everything that we've been training for all year round. Um, Andrew, we started this thing, no zero days, and Andrew's kept it up. Nummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like four years ago, I, well, I kind of got sick of getting so out of shape in the off season, right? So I was like, you know, I'm going to start just doing a workout every day, no matter what. And so, you know, Andrea was like, you know, posting about it and this zero, no zero days. And it turns out there was a guy that had a company called No Zero Days and, and uh, he's been going for 21 years. And he's actually got some muscle on his body, unlike myself. But, but uh, you know, um, I've been going for four years. And I actually think that's a really good thing to do because you kind of like, I mean, and this is through having COVID and, you know, after Nolan's, the day after a Nolan's, I'm not missing a workout. Now, it doesn't have to be a hard workout. It can be yoga, you know, something easy like stretching. But the, the point is to force yourself to do everything, something every day. And I, I think it's been amazing, honestly. I mean, sometimes it's hard at like, you know, midnight when you still have to get your workout in and, uh, you know, it sucks, right? But, but anyway, I think that's been positive. But anyway, there was this, this book I read once and uh, it actually had kind of a profound impact on me just thinking about it. And it was this, it was called like the Chronicles of Tao or something, but I, I kind of forgot most of the book, but I do remember the main character is this young kid in China and he goes to train with these like masters that live up in the mountains. And one of these masters, you know, and they all sort of like impart some wisdom upon him. And uh, one of these guys just basically sits there meditating most of the time. And, uh, but basically his philosophy was he was in tune with the earth seasons. And so like in the winter, he would sort of just 
stop you know, movement and just be very still. It's almost like hibernating. And then in spring is when he'd sort of start you know, blossoming into you know, his full potential. And then summer is when he'd have his full power. You know, and, then, and then in fall you know, is when he sort of, you've already peaked, but you're strong. And anyway, then the cycle continues. And I was like, kind of like, wow, that was, to me, that was kind of amazing of how you could be in tune with the earth in, in you know, you know, your training. I know that doesn't work for people that love you know, their winter sports and that's their number one thing, but for me, I was like, you know, so it's okay to have these natural cycles. You know, it's good. And, and uh, so every year when we get fat and depressed like this time of year, <laughs> I try to remind us that it's okay, these cycles are normal and you know. And we'll it's great start for you hard. know when you're training and you're training with that extra weight. It's like having a ten pound weight <laughs> in your pack, you know. <laughs> when you when you lose it, you're that much better. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, I mean, you guys have probably heard all this stuff, but importance yeah. of like cross training and stuff. And this is some of the stuff we do. Now, we've listened to some podcasts recently of some like real athletes that like go really fast. And, and this is not what they do, you know, like for sure. Yeah. Like they, they'll work hard. They might, we're you know, not professionals. Yeah, we're not. So you know, we have real jobs, we've got families. And so, if we're doing like an hour or two a day, we're doing great. You know, and uh, and so, but it's funny because you know you can still get in pretty good shape, you know, doing that. And uh, so, so anyway, this is sort of just some of the stuff that we do. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, North Table Mountain right by our house. We live in Golden. Uh, so we'll hop on that and do, do six to eight miles uh, on that. Mount Morrison is a mountain close to Red Rocks, and. I trained on that to prepare for the incline. Um, it's 1,800 feet in 2.7 miles. I mean, 1.7 miles. Um, so it's steep. And actually, I think that is more painful than the incline. I can't get myself to do more than two laps on Mount Morrison. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's just loose, crappy rocks. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, nice it's not like a yeah. nice staircase. So, um, so Mount Morrison is really good to get your climbing legs into shape. And then we'll just spend, we've got a lot of front range 14ers near us, so sometimes I'll get off of work and go head to Beerstadt or go do Grays and Tories from the bottom. Um, that was great training uh, this year. And then Insanity is awesome. I think that it's the best thing that you can do for any cross training. You get the full body workout and your cardio all in an hour of workout. And if you don't know what insanity is, it's called like hit training, like so high, high in interval intensity training or something like that. But basically you're jumping around, you're sweating like crazy inside and it sucks. It really does, but it works really well. And to give an example of how that works is, so last year I was determined not to do Insanity. You know, I, I hate it so much. I will rather go climb longs in a blizzard, you know, for an entire day than do a half hour Insanity workout. So I was out there in the mud every single day. In North Table gets horribly muddy in the spring, you know, when it's, it's warmer and you can't wait to be outside. And so I'm running out there in the mud and Andrea's like, no, nah, not having any of the mud. She doesn't want to be in the mud. She doesn't want to be in the snow. So she's in there doing Insanity every day. And so like three months later after that, you know, normally we do all of our workout toge workouts together, but that year, you know, last year was different. And so we go for our first run and she beat me in a run. And I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it really is the way to go like that. So, if you, you know, it works all your muscles, all your tendons and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's convinced me that the best way to train for running is not necessarily running. I mean, yeah. you know, if, yeah. I mean, maybe if you're pro level, that's different. Yep. But uh, and, and we then, do love mountain biking. So yeah, that's another oh great, yeah, we do love mountain great biking. Workout. And then the other thing too that we think we would like to do. I don't know. If we've, we, I mean, Andrea's had more injuries than me lately. But like, even when we're injured, I'd like to believe there's something we could do. If our foot, my foot's injured, we can go downstairs and do a weight workout. Or, you know, whatever, I could try kayaking, or I could do abs or something. I just like, I'm gonna fight it no matter what. If I get injured, I'm just gonna fight and I'm gonna try to be doing something every day. Yeah, and I think law of physics, an object in motion stays in motion. So we really advocate for just doing something every, all, all the time, every day. Um, and I think it's really good for your body. Tapering, this is just a light subject for us because we don't do it. Um, <laughs> and that's also not professional advice because there are many pro athletes that will tell you that it's absolutely critical and important too. But w one time I asked Andrew about it and he was like, why, the mountains don't taper? So that's kind of been our thing. Like, they don't taper, we shouldn't taper. And um, we do, before a big event, we do back off a few days beforehand and just do a light run or some abs or something. But usually it's just me stuffing my face thinking about 
about the next, how I'm going to be so anxious for the next three days and then feeling like a fat cow. So, you know, but that's okay. Um, and then the next is when are we ready? When do we feel like we're ready to go out and uh, be successful in this? You know, we want to go out, and, but we want to be successful too. I mean, one of the most obvious ones, and, and I think actually the Manitou incline here would be just perfect for this, mm -hmm. is like, you know, if you have what you know is a good time on Manitou incline for you, and you go out and you, you know, see how you do against your time. Go give yourself a PR. And if you beat that time, then you probably know you're ready. You know, if you've been training for a while and you're going to do something, you know, just stuff like that where you've got a benchmark you can compare mm -hmm. yourself to. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh, yeah, you know, we've got this thing about, like, mental readiness. One of the things we always experience every year, I swear, is, uh, is we, we go hiking with the kids. And like she mentioned, that's a topic. We could spend a whole thing about hiking with kids. Um, but one of the things they like to do is rest a lot. And that is like the worst thing you can do for us. Like we just need to be moving, moving, moving. And it's amazing how the resting just destroys your body. You know, just one little rest. And it's, I don't know what it is physiologically, but it just makes it so you, you, your legs don't work later. But um, so you'll do one hike with them and you'll finish the mountain and you'll be like, you'll be so worked. You think, oh my gosh, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to go up another mountain, you know? And so then, and then we start thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to do no one's else? It's impossible. Yeah. Right? But somehow our brains just like, we, they know we got to do 14 mountains, and so they just, you know, you keep going. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, I don't know the secret mm -hmm. to that. Just mm -hmm. uh, anyway. And then oh, the other thing that's kind of interesting between us is uh, I'm sort of like the, the, you know, the spreadsheet guy. I like, like looking at numbers, and so I've got my spreadsheets planned. If I you know, can hit those times, I'm, I'm going to feel ready. Andrea, she just needs me to tell her she can do it. Like, she'll be like, can I do it? I'll be like, oh, sure, you can do it. And then and she needs a hug. And, and, and she'll ask me the next day, same thing. Do you, you think I can do it? And I said, well, nothing changed since yesterday. So, yeah, I think you can do it. So, so it's just kind of funny how we're wired sort of differently. Mm. Okay, so now for the diet and nutrition part. And yeah. This is where I have to pass it off to Andrea. <laughs> yeah, Andrew. Uh. He likes chocolate cake, yeah. <laughs> um, he's, yeah, we're vegetarian, um, and the number one question we always get is, well, how do you get your protein? Do you get enough? Yes, 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 yes. We get lots of protein. Um, so uh, we uh, don't, Andrew doesn't follow a specific diet. Um, he doesn't really stay too much away from sugar. It was his birthday two days ago, and his sister made him not one cake, but two. So now he just gets to eat cake for the next, I don't know, week. Um, but I take my nutrition a little more seriously than he does. I wish I didn't have to, but um, I think that's a really important component of being successful in some of these things. And um, I think you need to fuel your body right. I think that's important. A lot of times, uh, sometimes I don't care about my nutrition, and I I can probably out eat every single person in this room. It's pretty amazing. Um, and I can eat a lot. Um, She's not kidding. Like, <laughs> you turn your back on her and you're like, the food will be gone. Like a pizza will disappear. And you'll be like, where pizza. did that go? <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> um, and then, so coming uh, out of winter is when I usually feel like, okay, I need to start uh, fine tuning and getting prepared for summer. So. I usually, for a week, do kind of an extreme diet. Um, I usually do one ingredient foods, fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, egg whites, and I kind of keep my workouts light for that week. Um, but that kind of just kind of men mentally set resets me and prepares me for the next seven, eight months to come. Um, and then there's just this maintenance where I really try to eat whole foods and not too many, not processed foods or uh, processed sugars, uh, carbs, anything like that. Um, I like to say anything that comes from a box, don't eat it. Um. As you can see, she's not very fun around this time of year. <laughs> like that, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of um, our focus on our diet. Race day is different though. Um, it's all the sugar, it's all the candy, it's all the carbs, all the junk food. Anything that's gonna motivate you to get calories in that you want to eat um, because it doesn't really matter what you're putting in your body. You just need the calories. You can talk on this. Yeah, I, I know a lot for a lot of like um, you know ultra endurance athletes, one of their biggest problems is like, you know, they'll be doing like say the 100 or something, they'll get to a point where they just can't stomach any food and they're throwing it all up and then they just don't have any energy. You know, so it's important to sort of find what works for your body. And, uh, you know, like, 
yeah, oh, it's interesting. We sort of broke it down into to different things too. Like, you know, so sometimes like on a shorter event, you can just get by with goos and stuff. And it was really funny because for the Manitou Incline this year, Andrea packed up these two big boxes full of like <laughs> potato chips and cookies and just all the stuff. I was so excited to be and, able to eat whatever I wanted. <laughs> yeah, she'd been on this diet and she's like, yes, this is the day I can eat everything, right? And I looked at those boxes and I was like, what are you doing? And she got all defensive, you know? I was like, okay, fine. So I lugged them up to the trailhead there and yeah, she didn't eat any of it. You know, she had some goose and some water, you know, that I gave her, you know, really. So, you know, you just never know, you know, with her exactly what she's going to want. Like, and then, you know, the, on the 24 hour record, she had a bagel and cream cheese and that was all she wanted. And then, you know, on Nolan's, it was like, she really liked those cookies with like, they're the really bad ones from King Supers where they have like an inch of frosting on top, you know, and man, those are like 200 calories each. And she was just snarfing those down, you know, so, so anyway, but you know, one thing I remember going to a nutritionist back in 2003 when I was getting ready to, to bike all the 14ers and they made it, you know, pretty clear because I was concerned about the quality of the calories and all that. And they were like, it just doesn't even matter when you're going, like you just need to get calories in your body, whatever kind of calories it will take. So it is kind of like your free pass to eat whatever you want while you're out there mm -hmm. um, you know and just whatever tastes good to you and hopefully you're just someone that, that can stomach it mm -hmm. and and additionally to food uh, something that's also really important is your liquids and in it we um, do electrolyte powder uh, which takes care of all your electrolytes which is great and then in another bottle we do hammer nutrition powder and so that's a lot of calories so you're still getting your liquids in and you're still getting nutrition so um, on the Manitou Incline, the 24-hour record, Nolan's, his records, uh, we always make sure that we have uh, powder with us. Um. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot that. That's been like yeah, my go-to for years. It's like, yeah. don't I don't bring food. Six-day trip, don't bring food. I just bring a big thing of powder, and you mix it with your water, and so it sort of like guarantees you're getting the right number of calories in all the mm -hmm. time. That works really well for me. Mm -hmm. um, with Andrea, a lot of times I'll bring all this powder, and then I'll finish the whole trip with a lot of powder because she never I'm wants to better. eat it. I'm getting better. She's getting a little better. Yeah. yeah. Um, we like to try to follow a food goal of 100 to 150 calories per hour. Um, that is hard to do. Um, it seems like not a lot, but you don't, when you're out there, you don't really want to eat. So we always have this goal. Um, and so we always pack according to that goal and we just try to eat as much as we can um, while we're going. But uh, the good thing about not meeting this goal is we're kind of prepared for it. We train ourselves uh, in our big training days to not need all the water. You know, sometimes I'll hike with friends up a 14er and they'll have a three liter camelback of Gatorade in their pack. And I'm like, well, I didn't take a sip like the whole hike up, you know? And so I think if you train yourself to not need all of that, it's really beneficial when it comes to race day. I mean, I feel like a lot of people think they need more than they actually do. We'll do, I mean, we'll do a 10 mile bike ride with some friends and they'll be popping gels in their mouths on mile two. And so I think that it's, I think that calories are important, but you, you can, you can make it a lot further than, um, than you think, but it's also important you don't want to bonk too. So you have to know your body. You have to go out, test your body, know what you can do, and know your limits. One funny story is uh, when we did Holy Nolans back in 2020, that's where you do Nolans and then you tack on Holy Cross for good measure at the end. And uh, we got down and uh, like I remember we, were, we weren't we were sure originally if we were going to go on and we were, we were down in the van and it was really hot. It was like the sauna because it was like the sun was out and we were baking in there and we had like eaten a bunch of food, right? So we were like stuffed mm -hmm. and, and then we decided, okay, well, we're going to go do it. And we were just thinking, oh, yeah, it'll, yeah, I don't know what we were thinking, honestly, because we it weren't. takes a long time to get over there. <laughs> but so we left with, like, Andrea would have been happy leaving with no food, like literally nothing. <laughs> and I, I snuck in, like, five of those little mini Snickers bars and and uh, and and, and thank a half a bag of powder. because it took us, like, 24 hours <laughs> to finish it off. And, uh, so that was all the food we had. So uh, anyway, we'll talk more about it later, like mm -hmm. this idea of intermittent fasting and what, why that might be good. But, mm -hmm. but basically, yeah. yeah, anyway. Sometimes I wonder how much better we would do with proper nutrition, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's true. As point. long as we're still moving and working, that's okay. So these were just, what, were these just some of the this training just some pictures? training days oh, yeah. um, out there, you know, cross training. This was uh, on our bikes. We did the white rim uh, two years ago or so. 
Um, that was a pretty cool adventure. And then this was our California 14ers. Uh, I love that picture. That was like a never ending sunset. It lasted for there a couple hours. There was a lot hours. of forest fires that year. Really and cool. uh, so the sunsets yeah. just lasted for hours. It was really mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the picture on the left, that was Andrew's centennial record. Uh, two, was that last? That two was years ago. Two years yeah. ago now. Um, and then the picture on the right was probably my one of seven trips to Decalibron at night. So <laughs> Andrea, she doesn't mess around when she's training for something. She gets up there a lot. Yeah. All right, and next we're going to talk planning, logistics, and crew. This is pretty crucial to all of our attempts that we do. So for a lot of these things, you know, so there's different styles you can do a lot of these adventures in. There's like unsupported, self-supported, and you know supported obviously I guess so unsupported a lot of people think that's the most pure just because you know you sort of start and everything's on your back and you got to go to the finish um, you know you don't get any help so and and so we've done that you know and, and that is you know hard to do and then there's also self-supported and that might be where well you don't want to lug this stuff the whole way so what you might go do is put some of your gear at certain spots along the way or food and pick it up along the way and then there's the supported ones and you know we've really grown to really like the supported ones it, it, it's really great to be able to share these adventures with other people and stuff like that and so we, we really do like that um, you know with the crew and we'll, we'll get more into the crew stuff and you know so 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 anyway mm -hmm. but like um, another big part of it is uh, scouting the routes out and this is really important and this is where Andrea really shines you know she's not someone that's like super comfortable being out there in the dark on her own yeah I actually hate yeah. it <laughs> and, and you know I mean I remember in my first record well actually you know if all the times I've climbed the 14 years I, I swear I'd have a story of being lost on every single one or in some blizzard or something and so I'm relatively comfortable being out there by myself or in whatever weather but Andrea she doesn't like it you know so when she prepares for these records she does it by scouting 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 so she just knows it inside out like she did graze so I mean graze is not a hard one she did it over and over there was like one bush where you had to remember to take a look at the bush Route. I'm yeah. not that ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, oh, we just saw it like yesterday and you need to go scout it again? Are you kidding me? But so well, she, I, she I have to go. advocate oh. for myself oh. here, okay? <laughs> um, so, so the only reason why I did that a million times was because in the 24-hour record, we're going for a time that you can't waste minutes. And so if I'm like five minutes behind on my splits on grays, then that sucks. Because when on the 24-hour record, when you get to Beerstad and Evans, because of the 3,000-foot rule, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but you have to ascend and descend a set of peaks 3,000 feet below the summit, or it doesn't count. So my last set of peaks was Beerstad and Evans. And so if I was climbing Beerstad, and I, did, I needed to know that I had enough time to get over to Evans and down 3,000 feet before the time clock out and so that was really stressful for me because on our spreadsheet I didn't even know if I could get 10 or 12 or 11 peaks and so so going up Gray's was really crucial Gray's and Torres because I needed every single minute I could have because I think we had maybe five minutes to spare on my split on my spreadsheet that I had and so it was really nice because I finished in 22 hours and so I had a lot more time than I thought but I didn't know that at the time so I stressed about every single route on the 24-hour record so maybe in the future when I have bigger records where the time isn't so scrunched he'll be happy to know that I probably won't be like that <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of uh, other stuff you have to think about too, and 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 actually this is really fun for a lot of people. A lot of people might not like this, but like you know you have to like maybe you know like some of these things like detailed instructions for your crew. I mean, I felt like when I did the 14er record in 2015, just well I had tried the year before in 2014, so I had a really good idea of how long things were going to take, and so I was able to like just give a really good plan and everybody knew exactly where they're going to be they knew exactly where i was when i was going to show up and it was actually accurate you know and and so it was just amazing it felt like this just finely tuned i don't know crew or, or mm -hmm. opera yeah. you know but uh but anyway um you know the, i mean there's a lot of things you got to think about you got to have the right gear for the time of yeah. year and, and stuff like that and yeah. staging gear and stuff yeah. like that we i guess we don't have to get into that mm -hmm. stuff yeah. So, and oh, the crew though, that's so important, you know, yeah. is like the crew. And that's where I, I feel like I've always been really lucky because like I had my family always helping me. And now I've got Andrea, you know, she kind of alluded to that when I, when I mm -hmm. first met her, 
uh, this guy, uh, Homie, he was actually going for the 14er record. He was the first guy in 12 years that had taken a shot at Cave Dog's record. And it was kind of exciting to watch him because for the first time, people were carrying trackers and you could follow along. And so I was all excited about it. And then Andrea and Kim were so excited about like climbing mountains. I was like, hey, maybe they'd want to be my crew, you know? Because <laughs> like my family was like, never again. Your crew. Yeah, I don't know like, how yeah. smart that was. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, you know, it's just like, and, and we've seen, you know, we've seen bad crews, you know, and, and we've seen good crews. And so it's, you know, it's so hard, you know, like, man, I'll tell you, at Nolan's it was amazing because Andrea actually didn't know half the people that were her crew. And it ended up being people that wanted her to succeed more than she even wanted to succeed herself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing how they were pushing her to go faster and, and really on top of it. Where I've seen other, other crews where, you know, we were helping a guy out and, you know, um, you know, we met him and we went back to the, you know, where his crew was waiting for him. And, you know, it was all dark and no one was around. So he was started knocking on doors and, is that somebody? Is, is that someone <laughs> like, there? And, oh, we, we felt bad for him. You know, I mean, it felt like the crew should be awake. You know, you should come in. They should doctor you up and, and get you out of there as fast okay. as they can, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah. so, so anyway. I'll, I'll yeah, it, crewing's hard. It's very tiring. And so I think that um, you need to understand that it, just as much as the athlete out there, crewing takes just as much effort. They're tired too. They're up all night. They're organizing your gear, figuring out how to feed you, hiking with you, pacing you, all these things that the crew members are doing that really when it's when it comes down to it, I feel like it's the athlete that just gets so much of the credit, but you have to understand how much work it is um, in the crew, uh, for the crew as well. I was going to say too, so I did the Centennial record a couple of years ago and that was where you climb all the Centennials and as fast as you could. And that time I really didn't have a lot of people, it was, um, you know, we had some friends help out for, you know, a week here or something or a week there, but Andrea was the one there the whole time and she was on her own the whole time. Um, or, or helping me out, and it's mm -hmm. so much work. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I remember there are people who have actually gone for the 14er record with like one crew member, and they don't, they underestimate how much pressure and stress it is on that crew member. They can't stay awake because they, they've been worrying about you all day. Then you show, you show up, and then they got to drive four hours in the dark, and they got to cook you food and rub your feet. And it's like so. It's so much work. And actually, it was kind of cool because when I did the Centennial record, it was like nobody really cared because it didn't have the word 14ers in it, you know? In Colorado, yeah, everyone wants yeah, to follow Yeah, who cares about Centennials, right? Like, and what are Centennials? <laughs> you know, and there's some great mountains that aren't 14ers in the state, you know? But it was funny because the one call I did get afterward from a reporter, they were like, hey, well, you know, good job on that Centennial thing. That was really cool. But we really want to talk to Andrea and about that support because that was really amazing what she did. And so they did appreciate, you know, everything that she went through. Yeah. Oh, the, my favorite story is the 28-mile delivery of a burrito for him. Oh, yeah. Man, oh, oh, that was... Oh, I was in the middle of the Weminuch. You know, I had, like, I still had... To, okay, so I still had to go over Pigeon, Turret, Eolus, North Eolus, Sunlight, Wyndham, Chicago Basin, and hike out to Purgatory. So it's a long ways to go, and I ran out of food. And just, I, I hadn't been eating food, but I was really hungry that day or something. So I call in Andrea, and I'm like, oh, I'm out of food. And so she had to hike in from Purgatory, like a burrito. All, and it ended up being like about 40 miles round trip, I guess, right, to bring me was the burrito. It? Something like that. Maybe like, was it 28? Or, or was it 28 oh, or something? Oh, 28 one way or something. Oh, I don't yeah. Know. Anyway, ridiculous. it was ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, so that is a support crew going above and beyond, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, here's just a picture some of like some of the spreadsheets and stuff we yeah. do. And, oh, yeah, this was so this was a picture of her. She had hiked all the way in to meet me somewhere. You that was know? on the bells. Um, yeah. Oh, that one's on the bells. Setting oh, okay. up the yeah. tent. Yeah. And then that's Andrew. That this was on the 20th. I actually hour. really like support. Like, I like switching into that role because, um, first of all, I think I'm good at it because they don't have to worry about me knowing where to go. Like, if it's 14 years, I'm going to know where yeah. to go. And then, you know, me, uh, you know, helping them with the gear and stuff like yeah. that. So this is finally I got to be the support crew. Um, oh, this was kind of one of our story too. So that was my sister on the Centennial record. And th this particular day, I guess she had, was really excited. She has just made herself this breakfast that she was about to eat. And I just happened to come in at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so she could have looked at her bowl, said, and she handed it off to me. You know, there you go. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. And then, you know, of course, they support crafts to deal with stuff like this all the time. You know, so they better know how to change a flat tire and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, this was us going above and beyond for Andrea. So when she did Nolan's this year, it was super low water. And so we were able to take this shortcut over by La Plata that you can't normally do because uh, the river is too high. So we were out there, like, 
pushing rocks around so she wouldn't have to get her feet wet. You no, know, so we were going, and this was, this was all of us heading out there to go push some rocks around. So anyway. So ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is just some more pictures. This was, uh, oh yeah, the, oh, 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 oh yeah, I guess, I mean, anyway, these guys hiked way out in the middle of nowhere to meet us. And uh, yeah, so, and now the next one, you see, that was, uh, we implemented the ATV on the 24-hour record yeah. just to try to save a few minutes. Or know. just because it looks cool. Yeah, well it, well, it was fun. It was fun, but, but man, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. A lot of work it did to save get that us time, for sure. This yeah. is uh, this was uh, So after my Centennials record, there was one day in particular where I just, and it was early, where I just blew up. My body was completely swollen. I actually got a hernia that I didn't even, I don't even know when I got it. Yeah, I noticed it when my body de-swelled. But uh, anyway, it was this was the support crew, all the drugs they had to go get yeah. for me, you know, just to keep yeah, me going. Yeah, I mean, talk about flexibility, because he comes down and we think he's doing great, and then he gets in the car and he just swells up and can't breathe and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we have, uh, Andrew's sister is also a nurse, and so she knows all of the medications and all of the docs. So we're like, we need to get him this and this and this, and he needs to take this at this time, but you can't mix it with this med. And so it was just a mess. So finally we got him stabilized to where he could, you know, go out and hike again. But uh, we're gonna talk about some lows later on. <laughs> Which is now. <laughs> <laughs> mental. This is one of my favorite parts is the mental. Because like I mentioned before, I don't consider myself like a really great athlete. Like when you follow athletes, they're so fast. And I just don't know. I, I mean, I, don't, I, I have no desire to go train that hard and try to become that fast, you know. But, you know, um, recently, though, I read this book called That Which Doesn't Kill Us. And I was surprised because everybody seemed to know what I was talking about. And it was like this life-altering thing for me. But it was about this... Um, the, the main the well, subject you guys know is this Wim guy, Wim Hof. Have you heard of him? You know, Wim yeah. Hof, he's like the cold weather guy. And, uh, you know, it's all about subjecting yourself to cold and making yourself tougher and stuff. And the book really spoke to me. One of, one of the tenets of the book is how we've all become so soft in modern times. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we do everything we can to, like, not be comfortable, or to be comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's just everything we do is about being comfortable. And if you think about our evolution into the humans... I mean, we have survived some really hard stuff. Like we, our bodies can, they can go through a lot. And we've kind of forgotten about that because like life has become so easy for us. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's important to go out there and suffer. It's good for you. You know, I tell my kids this all the time. They don't buy it. Mm -mm. They don't buy it. But, and I, I mean, the cold thing is hard for me. I, we've been dipping into it. Like the other day we had these big clients and friends were over. We're like, hey, let's go in the river tomorrow. This was just like last mm -hmm. week. And then it was snowing the next day and we were like, ah, oh, or maybe not. But, you know, we still do try like <laughs> running with our, you know, shirts off when it's cold and stuff like that. Just trying to get into that. And there's, a, there's another show, I recommend you all watch it if you can. It's called Limitless on Disney Plus. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's Chris Hemsworth who plays Thor, you know. And basically he's searching for the secret to longevity, you know. And so every one of these episodes he explores, you know, one of the episodes is about cold. And uh, I, I'm just annoyed because not only is he like super amazing looking and I've got all the muscles, but when he gets in freezing cold water, he doesn't like be like, ah! Like, like me, you know, I'm like, <laughs> so he's tough, but, but, uh, so one's about cold. There's another one that talks about benefits of like fasting. And that's kind of like, well, you know, a lot of the times we do so well when we're not eating, whereas other people we know will fall apart if they, they, they're not eating all the time. It's really actually, you know, really good for you to fast every once in a while. So I encourage you to research mm -hmm. into that. Another of the episodes was Strength. about, um, well, strength and, and uh, yeah, it was kind of like endurance strength. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, mm -hmm. we, of yeah. course, you know, we like that stuff. And there was one about like putting yourself in stressful situations and that went why that's Memory. good for you. Yeah. You know, if you think about like all of our like furry ancestors, you know, they had to deal with the stress, you know, some dinosaurs going by. Yeah. You know, they can deal with stress. I, I guess it's good for you, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, anyway, I recommend looking into some of the stuff. It's really amazing. And like some of the health benefits mm -hmm. are, are really good, but, um, Anyway, I was going to mention, let's see, what was I going to talk about on the rest of this stuff? Oh, I mean, I guess I, I covered Yeah, we'll just go to the next yeah. slide. But before we talk about mental, I recently found just two quotes. And I just want to read them because I, they really hit home for me. And um, one of them is, you don't have to be a professional athlete or an ultra marathoner to complete an epic multi-day trail run, hike, or climb. You just have to be crazy enough to say yes and accept the inevitable beatdown that will happen to you along the way. 
Um, and then the other one that I really love is if you love adventure, you have to be able to turn your brain off and enjoy the suffering part of the process. It's going to hurt, deal with it. Heart trumps training. And so that kind of reminds me, like, when we go out for these things that is really hard and we want to quit because we're miserable, um, you have to remember the why and why you're in it and that you know it's going to hurt, but that hurt's going to go away. And when it does go away in an hour or a day after you stop, you're going to regret quitting if you do quit because um, you, because you're not mentally strong or you, you didn't think you were mentally strong enough to continue. So that was one of the biggest things on Nolan's. Um, I had a really, really hard night. Um, Columbia was fine, but then Harvard, Oxford, Belford, Missouri uh, were four really difficult peaks. And Andrew tried really hard to perk me up. He was singing to me. And I was, yeah, I was singing. <laughs> I was trying to dance. I was doing everything. And she was in such a grouchy mood. And yeah. Then, and then it made me sad. Yeah. And so then we kind of fought a little bit. And I was like, this is dumb. So 6 a.m. rolled around. And then I'm crying, you know. And I'm like, why well, don't want to do this if we're just going to fight. Like, I, this is supposed to not be this way. And we're both tired. And and I just told him I wanted to quit. And he was like, that's fine. You can quit. But you're going to regret it because in tomorrow, when you're wishing that you didn't quit, you're, you're going to wish you didn't quit. And so, um, and so I just think that that's really important going into uh, the future for more so me. Andrew's really good at the mental. But just to know that how to mentally strengthen my mind um, is it's a challenge it really is and you have to push push past that somehow we mentioned there it's always a work in progress you know it's never yeah. going to be easy and then oh some of the lowest moments we oh we could talk about a couple of these ones like um the, well just start uh, from the top oh let's see well centennials oh my gosh so you know i had this thing planned for years i've been thinking about this like how to link up the centennials and on the very first day which I'd already rerouted from the ideal route because of, uh, you know, Calabra, and I just wanted to get that out of the way because you have to pay for it and be there at a certain time. And then it snowed. And so, and I had never actually gone from Phoenix Peak, which is over by San Luis and, and uh, you know, by Creed. I'd never actually done the ridge all the way over to Stewart. And on the map, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a couple inches, you know? I didn't think it'd be so bad, you know? But it was like snowing all night long, and there were so many ups and downs. And so I was just completely destroyed at the end. And I was, I was like, I, I came out and I was like, well, obviously I'm just going to quit and restart this like in a couple mm -hmm. weeks. And Andrea, like, she made me keep going, you know. And uh, and then you know the weather was coming mm -hmm. in, so we had to reroute the whole thing. Anyway, that was yeah, that's that's another story. But I think but anyway, your, your biggest low was the bike oh, crash. oh, and then the bike crash. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. So I was coming down out of the crest stones, and it was like it would have been a cool movie this one because I remember I had left my pack at tree line to go and snag Humble because I had just done like Adams, Kit Carson Challenger, and the Crestone Needle, Crestone Peak, and then I just still had to get humble before I got out of there. And uh, so I, I, you know, I left my pack there at Tree Line, went up humble, and right is this, and it had been a perfect day, and then this storm rolls in, and it was like lightning bolt, shoom, lights up the sky, you know, because it was dark, you know, and then another one, and every time I'd run a little faster, you know, and uh, anyway, I didn't quite make it to my bag before this, like, massive hailstorm hit, and so I've got no protection, you know, and I, I dive under this thing, but, so anyway, I get to the pack, I survive the hail, and then I get down to where Andrea's left my bike for me, and now I just gotta, you know, and that's usually my favorite part. Well, and a text message that he's annoyed about me warning him that oh. it's wet and slick. I was like, well, it's always wet and slick on that road, but it's really funny because where I did eventually crash and go over my handlebars there was right where she sent me the message from. But uh, it, 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 yeah, it was funny because you know I can see because she was using the tracker, and later I was like, oh wow, that's right where I crashed. But anyway, like I crashed and uh, and oh that was so bad. Then I couldn't pedal anymore because my my leg would cramp every time I went around, so I just had to coast all the way down. And then I got there and I bang on the door and I'm like Andrea, and uh, so she ended up. You know, taking me to a hotel. Oh, yeah, he's like, Andrew's wailing, he's falling on the ground, and I'm like, oh, God. Like, I just pray every time before Andrew comes in, I'm like, please don't let him be injured, you know? It's just, I want him to be well because I didn't, A, I didn't want a crew for this project ever again in my life, and so, and I knew that if he failed, we would be doing it again. Yeah, she was <laughs> not going to let me quit. There was yeah. not Yeah, allowed. there was no quitting. So, so, so this was his ultimate low of lows, so he really was 
was enjoying the hotel. We got a hotel one time before this as well. And so his sister had left, so I was on crew alone at this time. And I take him to the hotel, and his calf is all cramping up. And so I'm like, oh, pickle juice. Let's do it. That seemed to have worked before or something. And um, yeah, we heard that's really good for cramps. Yeah, so I, I gave him. He's like, I'm like, go take a shower. And... <laughs> and I'm going to and just drink this pickle juice. So I just hear him in there and he's puking and puking and puking. I mean, and so then I'm like, holy crap. So I'm like bathing him. He's like incoherent. I'm like, what am I going to do? I mean, this was the lowest moment. I'm like calling. It's like four, two o'clock in the morning. I'm calling his sister in a panic. She's got her phone silenced. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. And so he thinks he's done. And I'm like, no, we're not done. We're just like on pause. I was like, we can do pikes tomorrow. And so, and that's in like five hours. So I'm trying to, you know, get him bathed, get him to stop puking, get him in bed so he can get some sleep. And then he's kind of in his mind, like, there's no way I can go on tomorrow. And I was like, well, let's just get you some sleep and then we'll wake up and figure it out. So, um, actually Lisa is here tonight. She kind of saved us on pikes because, um, I took him up pikes and I, you know, I was like, you're going to feel better. You just have to get hiking again. So we went up pikes. It took him hours and hours and hours. He was laying down on the ground taking naps. He was so dehydrated. He didn't have any calories in him. He couldn't keep anything down. Nothing sounded good to him. It was a disaster and I felt so helpless. All I could say, he was getting mad at me because I was like, you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat. You know, we have to get you to keep moving. And so then we called Lisa because the only thing that sounded good to him was Noosa yogurt. And so I was like, Lisa, you need to go to the grocery store and get us some Noosa yogurt, please. So finally, she met us at the bottom, and we got some more calories in them. And this was right before a huge, massive, what, 24-hour or day, because that was when you did Little Bear Blanca yeah, and all of yeah, that. So yeah. that was just kind of the ultimate low of the centennial record. That was um, pretty spectacular. And then one thing I'd like to talk about for Andrea, too, is uh, the first time we did Nolan, she had a really rough first night, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't finish that time, actually. We failed. And, uh, and so that, the, in training, she was like, OK, I'm going to have a good first night. I'm going to have a good first night. <laughs> and so the next time we did Nolan, she had a great first night. But then we got to night two. I forgot to and, yeah, tell myself forgot I was going like, to have a good second night. night. Too. <laughs> yeah. So that was a low. So now, and that, yeah, we're still working on night twos with Andrea, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, what's this one? so this is something we've kind of touched on just knowing that you can get through the mental lows that they're just lows if you're not injured just know that you can push through because you will regret quitting you, everyone always does um, you feel like crap in the moment and something huge that Andrew told me was on Nolan's was um, I think I said it already, but you can quit, but you're just going to regret it. And so just think about uh, the task that you have at hand. Think about if you're doing the incline multiple times, just think about that next step or think about this one lap. Don't think about um, anything else. And so that really got me through. On Nolan's, if you go south to north, um, the last three peaks are huge. I mean, you're doing three peaks in 20, it's like 18 hours. And so standing on top of the third to last the third to last peak and I'm like, holy crap, I have 18, 19 hours of hiking ahead of me still. How am I going to do this? Andrew was like, don't think about that. Just think about the next mountain. So I think really just um, thinking about the task that you have at hand uh, will really help you uh, to kind of take everything one step at a time. So. And, and remember, your body just wants to be comfortable, so it's going to do everything it can to get you to quit, mm -hmm. right? Everything. So you have to fight it. You really have to fight mm -hmm. it. And anyway, this last thing is just this little quote. We actually have it printed on the board in our house because I really like it. Mm -hmm. It's like, be not afraid of going slowly. Be only afraid of standing still. We sort of apply that to all of our adventures, but also it like works for life too. You know, it's sort of like... I like that quote. You always want to be growing and moving in the direction of forward. And then, uh, what was this one we were just sort of talking about? There's something called the sleep monsters. That's mm -hmm. when you're out there and you just desperately mm -hmm. want to go to sleep, and, and, and it's called the sleep monsters. And, you know, what, what I learned over the years is you, you can win the sleep battle. It is like you don't have to have sleep, especially like 24 hours. You don't need sleep. Like, period, I'm right. Yeah, trust me on that one. You know, 48 hours, maybe, you know, maybe you need some sleep, yeah, right? I mean, we yes, say experience yeah. 
most people yeah. usually don't need sleep within that 48 yeah. hour mark, but that doesn't yeah. work for everybody. Um, sometimes some people do need a little yeah. cat nap or a half hour here, a half hour there. That's fine. Back in adventure racing, it was common for us to like be doing great and then we'd run off somewhere in the middle of the night in the wrong direction, you know, and then we'd lose all of this time. And so I became convinced that you needed, if we had just had some sleep, we wouldn't have made that mistake. And so that was kind of my philosophy. But then I raced with like a really good team and they sort of beat it into me that you don't need sleep. And like, you know, if you do sleep, you'll lay down for like five minutes until you start to shiver and then you get going again. And then so it's called a shiver sleep. And it is amazing how there's a certain amount of time, five, 15 minutes, where there's just this mental reset and you get up and you can go again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so amazing, like our brain. Mm -hmm. if, we, if, we just, like, if you could just easily turn that switch, it would mm -hmm. be so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, oh, here's a, no, that, that actually, that picture of Andrea under a sleeping bag, I have many versions of that picture. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like getting up early. Yeah, I love that. And then, I don't know, we just threw that up. That's just me suffering just without my goggles. Out there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And then here oh, I am. Oh, what yeah. was this? Oh, that so, was bikes. So, so yeah, that bikes. was when I was really that hurting. That was the day after he was puking. I will say, I look pretty skinny there. <laughs> I had definitely lost some weight already. Yeah, and then the picture to the left, that was after a huge uh, link up in the Elks, doing the whole Elks Traverse. So that took him <laughs> a long time and longer than he expected. So that was definitely a sigh of relief when he was done. And then this is our own type of suffering that we put ourselves <laughs> through willingly. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I love the expressions on my kids' faces. Is there. Oh, don't they look happy? Like, <laughs> and uh, and then oh, we, we tried to take our, our the older kids. This is Sydney and Axel this year because they're really strong, and we were going to do a family. No one's uh, no, that did not. Like, <laughs> massive and Albert, that like they still remember that we were going that direction. Those were the first two, and they remember that as the worst day of their life, basically. So we switched that trip around a lot after that. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Oh, that was oh, me. So oh, we have a couple videos. A, a, a couple have. videos. This was me suffering oh oh on the it's winter like, 14ers because the wind is too hard and it's hurting my eyes i can't see what i'm doing so now i'm like stuck behind a rock i don't know what the fuck to do i'm too cold to stop for too long though so if something happens to me it's just because i couldn't fucking see where i was going <laughs> Okay. And then this, oh, so this was one of our uh, women Uch trips with the kids, and um, and uh, Sydney left her sunglasses up on uh, one of the Trinities, and so Andrew decided that he could go back and look for it, but it was, um, we were in a thunderstorm, and so uh, what he does to go back to look for some sunglasses is pretty spectacular. Uh oh, uh oh, that hurts. That's my hair. Oh, there they are. Okay, good. Alright. Get off this bastard. This is pretty scary, I must say. Yeah. Wow. That is some electricity. <laughs> uh, this is like not happy laughter. This is scared laughter. Oh, look, it quit. Oh, kind of. All right. All right, well, I better concentrate on getting down. So, bye. So that's not smart, you know, and lightning storms never get easier. Um, when you do these multi-day adventures, you're bound to get stuck in lightning storms. And I hate them every single time. I hate electricity. I hate the sound of it. It brings back PTSD. I feel like I'm going to get struck by lightning every time I'm up there. So, um, but it is inevitable, especially um, we have some upcoming really big adventures and it's going to happen. And so I think that's something that I'm going to have to work on is just kind of blocking that out and uh, if I die up there I told Andrew I was like well at least I'll die doing something cool I don't know <laughs> makes me feel better a little bit <laughs> she's um, not gonna die she's gonna be fine <laughs> I was like I'm like Andrew 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 <laughs> you know oh, oh yeah that was funny like yeah the, the lightning's coming in right and actually it didn't come that close but but she was like grabbing onto me like this and I couldn't move and she didn't want me to take off my jacket because I was or like put it on. Uh, or put it on I was like it's hailing I want to put my jacket on it's like no no and uh it was funny like that's uh, gonna make a difference you know <laughs> but uh 
Anyway, so I mean, the last slide was just like, why do we think we make a good team? And uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, we just like. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, we respect each other, you know, everything, you know, what he has to say and what I has to have to say, we listen to each other, we encourage each other. Um, we do have a similar athletic ability, and I think that's really important. If you're with someone who has a completely different athletic ability, their strengths are, you know, so far off from yours, uh, it's not going to work. But because Andrew trained me and kind of took me under his wing, I became a version of him. So everything that he thinks is right and good, I think is right and good. And, uh, and so... For better or worse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, we really love each other and we really support each other. We want each other to succeed. I feel like that uh, when you go after some of these things, you feel like you have your support crew but or your support you know, people around you in your corner, but sometimes they doubt you and sometimes they think you're not going to be able to do something. But Andrew... If he tells me that I can do something, I know that I can do it. Even if I do fail, you know, one time or another, I know eventually I'll get there. And, you know, his support is really just everything to me. And um, and I hope to, you know, be the same for him. So, oh, also, you can't hide your true self out there when you're suffering. So you have you should have a good partner that can kind of take that. Uh, because sometimes it's not pretty and you have bad moments and you get angry and you get grumpy and you fight so you kind of have to I would say if I was a marriage counselor go do Nolan's before you get married and see, how, see if you like each other that would be a really good test because yeah you can't really hide who you really are yeah mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah and that's so, it guys I guess that's all we got Did you ever see yourself wanting to do the seven summits um, oh, you I know, guess we need this. Oh, yeah. So the question was, you know, do we see ourselves wanting to do the seven summits? And, you know, it really, yeah, I don't know why. It just isn't really something that's ever really perked my interest, especially lately with, like, images of the way Everest has just turned into just this mess. Like, I don't know. I've heard it's still really beautiful, but I don't know. It just doesn't really speak to us. Plus, you need to have a lot of money, and we don't. Yeah, and I mean, we've had that, aspirations. All, yeah. I think yeah. the biggest mountain that we've ever had aspirations to do is probably Denali, which, you know, we've thought about wanting to do it. But but then we get so sidetracked by planning the next four years of our summers. So <laughs> yeah. we're like, well, we don't really yeah. know when we're going to do that. So maybe when, I don't know, we want to stop chasing FKTs. <laughs> but we do we do want to go around and do, like, other big mountains in, in other countries. But, yeah, I just don't know if the cards will ever, you know, come together for, like, something in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we could go try there or something you know yeah yeah I don't know I, I think we'd be good we'd be good out there I mean not as good as the Sherpas those guys are amazing but I think we'd be we'd be pretty good out there you know. but yeah yeah any, any, anyone else? anything else um yeah on the hiking through the night because yeah I get mm -hmm. terrified hiking by myself in the dark so like what do you do to get through that <laughs> Um, you, you know, yeah, I don't really like hiking by myself, but, um, but you were fine in the I dark did on find hours. that on the 24 hour record, I was okay. I think I was more anxious. I think my mind was occupied. I was more anxious about not getting lost and just getting up there. Um, Lisa met me on the top of Grays and Tories uh, on the 24-hour record, so I knew that she was up there, so I knew that I just had to get up there. So um, I listened to headphones or music, and so I just kind of popped my headphones in and, and kind of block everything out. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, you just kind of have to know that you're going to be okay and kind of just put your big girl pants on, I guess. I think in Colorado especially, like, most of our fears are just, like, you know, most of the, you know, you're, you're going to be fine. Like, I mean, I've run into a mountain lion once before in, in front of, it was actually during Nolan's and it was in front of me on Yale and it was just walking up the trail in front of me. And I don't know, it just didn't seem that interested. It, it just wanted to get away from me. And I've seen, same thing with bears. Usually they just don't want to have anything to do with me. I have yeah. seen some scary YouTube videos of the bears that did want to attack, but they're usually grizzlies somewhere in some other state. So I think like here, I mean, honestly, you know, you just have to think, well, what am I afraid of? Is it really rational? Like, right. Yeah, like, I think yeah. it's your mind, really, that gets to you the most. I mean, I remember my scariest moment was hiking that 28 miles and to give him a burrito. It was in the dark. I was by myself. And I remember just keep looking in back of me because I'm like, oh, something following me. Um, so I just had my music blasting and I, and I just, you know, you kind of have to turn your mind off because it can get the best of you for sure. Yeah. Okay. And what about foot care on really long? Oh, that's, oh, that's, a, that's good a good question. That's, yeah. uh, foot care. Um, yeah, foot yeah. care. Um, yeah. We've, 
ha struggled with this many, many times. I oh, mean, I have all to, from... Wait, I have to tell yeah. the story. I have to tell the story. So when I first met Andrea, you know, she lived in Florida and, and she just liked hiking with me and the kids because we would go really slow. Like, you know, with Axel, he was like four and like one mile an hour, you know, so she liked that because there's no pressure on her. You know how a lot of times if you're hiking with someone that's really fast and you feel all this pressure and you don't want to slow them down. Well, so she's, it's great. She, we got Axel. And so she'd flown out from Florida and it was going to join me and my sons. Like, and we were going to do actually kind of like the Nolan's route. It was like Yale, Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, Belford, Missouri. And we got like not very far up Yale, the first mountain. And she's like, oh, well, you know, she's got a blister. And I was like, oh, you know, we better stop immediately and put some compete on there, you know. And so we did. And, uh, and then on the way down, you know, you know, it was like still bothering her. You know, we had decided to come back down Yale and, and start restart the next day. But uh, I remember her like with this big blister and then she was like ripping it like the, the compete hadn't stayed on very well. And so she was pulling it off and she was just like mm -hmm. disgusted. And so she's just ripping and her skin's coming off. I was like, no, what are you doing? And she still had like, you know, we still have like two days of, of hiking to go. And she was just so tough. Like I was really like, that's when I knew that she was kind of special was just because she was so tough with just blisters. Because blisters hurt. Well, you he know, told me they'd numb yeah. out. So oh, I was like, oh. Right. And that was the other thing. Is she would listen to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, those will numb out. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was funny. There was another time when one of her friends, like this guy, you know, she was dating, went to, to see her like while she was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And he was complaining to her about these blisters he had. And I was thinking to myself, you are complaining to the wrong person. Because, you know, she, you know, doesn't yeah, get bothered like, by blisters. I would yeah. get these half dollar size blisters. And so foot care was a hard for me for a really long time. I went to REI one day and I was like, no shoes ever worked for me. So I was just desperate to find another shoe. In one of their garage sales, I picked up a pair of Solomon X Ultra and they were like 40 bucks and my size. And I was like, shoot, I'll try them out. And I never got a blister again. It was spectacular, and now they're discontinued. So um, I'm not really sure what I'm going to yeah, do this coming year with footwear. I bought four pairs of them, and I'm on my last pair. So um, I don't know, but we've also struggled with not only blisters but foot tendons. So a lot of times uh, where your shoelaces cross, uh, it'll really irritate your foot tendon, and then we'll get tendonitis. And so sometimes we'll have to unlace our shoes and... Uh, and just to give our tendons a break. But a lot of the foot care, I mean, I haven't had to deal with that recently, yeah. which was great. And, and it kind of depends on the foot injuries you're talking mm -hmm. about. If it is like blisters, you know, for me lately, I've been using this stuff called Luco tape, which is just like a tape. I mean, duct tape would probably work. People use duct tape in the past, but there are tapes. That if you put it on the spots, before, you know, get to know those spots that are gonna be a problem mm -hmm. and deal with it beforehand. Like I have these like ski boots and they're like medieval torture devices, mm -hmm. right? But if I pre-tape all the spots I know are gonna be bad, at least it's bearable. Yeah. You know, and if it's not blisters, if it's tendon stuff, then man, you really just gotta just hunt work around your, and try to find Yeah, and you have to and, work, you, you know, work you know, all the tendons in your yeah. feet. We uh, put a, uh, one of those stretchy bands, we just wrap that around, you can wrap it around a table leg or something and just stick your foot in it and do uh, some foot exercises and just, uh, you know, flexing and pointing your foot that really gets those little tendons in there. But also my favorite sock is the darn tough socks. That's all I wear. Um, they will always send you a new pair if it gets holes. They're guaranteed, I don't know, lifetime, I think. And, um, and I think that they're super uh, effective against blisters. So sock recommendation for you. There's a whole book called yeah. like fixing your feet and it's about a billion different ways to like deal with blisters and stuff and mm. I don't know that's just something it's it's a journey you know mm -hmm. you just got to be tough mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and deal with it I guess I don't know it's like yeah, I it's our to, answer to everything oh, I don't know just suck I used it up. to suffer so bad with the blisters like it was like I'd come in I'd have so many blisters I'd, I'd need a wide toe box you know because I'll get blisters in between my toes because the toe box is too narrow and uh, and so and, and like I said, it's not something that should stop you. It's not like you broke your leg or anything, but it hurts. But you know what I did discover was if you just start hiking for about 30 minutes or maybe even a little less, pretty soon it doesn't hurt as bad until you stop again. You know, so that's when I would, would tell her, oh, they'll numb out, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So it's true, but it's not pleasant, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any other questions? Oh yeah, go ahead.
balance training while also like including the kids sometimes? And have you found anything that works with motivation? Well, oh, that's a good tell question. Tell all yeah. about the jewels. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. I, I feel like when my kids were younger, I was better at this. You know, honestly, like, so, I mean, starting, you know, with my kids when they were, like, four seemed to be this magic age where, holy crap, they could hike a whole 14. Or actually, my daughter, Scarlett, when she was three, hiked all the way up massive. I had to carry her all the way down because she was out. Like, she was She, she was, was putty. putty. <laughs> she was putty, you know, in my arms. I could have thrown her up or down. It wouldn't have mattered. But, you know, with the kids... Like, so when they were little kids, you know, like, so the secret, this was, this was amazing. So first mountain for Calvin um, was going to be Antero. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a vehicle that would get us up very far. So we're hiking, fr this is from the bottom at Baldwin Gulch. And it's like eight miles to get to the summit from there. And it's like 5,000 feet. And he's four. And so anyway, I had this brilliant thought to like, tell him that there were these jewels hidden on the top of the mountains and, and it was this hard day up there so we get up there and he hunts around and he finds this spectacular green jewel and I've got this picture of him like holding this up in the light <laughs> and even though that was such a hard day for him I mean I've got pictures of him just collapsed on rocks you know we're waiting for him he suffered because you know, I know I had his little brother in my pack so I couldn't really carry Calvin but that just sparked this whole new thing with all my kids actually where I would hide these jewels on top so I'd always Always be like going to the rock shop, buying jewels, and so for them it was all about finding these rocks. And up that's there. all that they yeah. would remember. That's all they would remember. They had oh, gone yeah. through these amazing yeah. highs and lows, and yeah. never hiking again. Yeah. And then it's when are we doing the next one? I want another jewel. And and and, uh, and, and they are amazing at how they would forget the pain. Just you know, there's a the whole thing about how there really shouldn't be any humans if, if women remembered the pain of having, you know, a baby, right? But they forget, right? Well, kids are like that too. You know, they forget the pain. And, but, but I don't know, there was just something special about my oldest two. They just, and even now, they don't really like exercise that much, but they still just love the mountains. So I don't know what it is. They just love hiking the mountains, maybe because I started them so young or something. And stories is another Oh big gosh, one. oh, how could I forget stories? Oh my gosh. I had to tell stories like for the entire hike up. So I would like combine every fairy tale plus every movie plus every episode of Star Trek like Voyager that I ever saw into one long continuous story. And, and they love my stories. They really thought, they still remember the kids now they're grown up and in college and stuff. They still remember like these stories that I was telling. And like the moment I stopped telling the story, like how tragic it was for them. You know, so that was another, mm -hmm. you know, um, a way I would motivate them to go up there. And then my kids got older and, you know, it was the weirdest thing for me because they'd be in elementary school. And can you imagine a kid that says their least favorite class is PE? Like, I just, I can't even comprehend what they're talking about. And so... I, I don't know. So none of my kids really love, love, well, you know, Axel's kind of getting into like weightlifting, yeah. which is not me, but, but, uh, <laughs> but so I don't know the secret. You know, we've got other friends that were like Olympic athletes and of course their kids are like Olympic athletes. And so <laughs> I don't know how they did it, you know, you know, and uh, so I, I don't know, but if you're talking little kids, yeah, you can do little tricks like that to keep it fun, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and candy, candy is oh, a Candy, the, yeah, yeah, we're always leaving, know. like, yeah, yeah, for them, they also, yeah, they get all the candy. <laughs> when we're out there, you know, we go to the store, and I'm carrying bags of Skittles. I, like, I would carry a full-on backpacking pack up just a little 14er with, like, stuffed animals, you know, because we'd have to line up all the stuffed animals <laughs> on the top and take pictures of them. I'd have to have all the jewels ready to hide, you know, for the kids. And so, yeah, it was a lot of work, you know, and then telling the stories, it was a lot of work. And... And, and uh, I mean, looking back, though, those are really good days. You know, I, I, I'm kind of sad that they're gone. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I hope I answered your question a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, any, any other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, man, that's another good question. We are so excited about this year. Yeah. Um, man, we got a lot of big goals. So, so, you know, last year was Andrea's year, right? You know, she had this amazing year. And, and actually, I was supposed to do Nolan's with her, but I got a kidney stone like the week before. Actually, it's kind of funny because we were practicing our cold wa water. You know, we, we were by Harvard, you know, uh, or no, we were no, by uh, it, it uh, Winfield. Harvard, yeah, near, yeah, near Winfield. And, you know, we were camping. And so we got, got in the river. And Andrea is amazing. She could do three minutes, mm -hmm. no problem. I, for me, like a minute, you know. And so that was, but for some reason, I don't know if that did something to me, but, but that night I got a kidney stone. And I've had these in the past and they are awful. 
And uh, that was misery. So I couldn't do Nolan's with her, but I was in pretty good shape this year. Mm. Like, so I probably could have had my best time ever. Like, my best time was like a 53 hours, and I could probably get under 50. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, so I would like to try it again with her maybe next year. So we were thinking about trying Nolan's again as a team. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's, you know, the Song Grays Mountains. There's like a line that just does all the Song Grays. Yeah, this is probably, this is going to be our early June um, adventure. And we don't tell a lot of people our plans, so just keep it on the DL. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the Sangres is a 100-mile link up. It's 60-some peaks, maybe 70. I'm not really sure. Is it 60-some? I think it's over 70. Um, yeah. Over 70, yeah. And so we would like to take that FKT uh, down to about, I don't know, I think it's pretty three, solid already, but two. yeah, I don't know. So we don't know exactly what yeah. we can do with that yet, but we're super excited. We hope that that will be our base. And then what's a summer without Nolans? And then um, we want to get out to Wyoming and do all of the 13ers out there and kind of set an FKT for that. It's an ambitious summer. And then at the end of the summer, if we're still feeling it, there's this race, which we don't race. Um, this is kind of more to prepare for the following year. I think more so for me, I'm a little selfish about that. Um, but it's called the High Five 100 and it uh, is a 100 mile link up and you have Handy's, Red Cloud, Sunshine, Wetterhorn, is it? Handy's, Red Cloud, Sunshine, Uncompagre, and Wetterhorn. And so you link up all of those 14ers in a, and some other peaks in a 100 mile loop. and. Um, and so that is kind of a, kind of we're going to use a lot of scouting down in the San Juans. I need to get to know those peaks a lot more um, because in 2024 is I'm going to go for the 14er speed record. So in hopes to uh, set a good time on that, I would like to be confident and comfortable in you know all of the 14ers and not just the ones that are closer to me. So. Yeah, so we've got we've got a lot of plans. So we'll see we'll see what we get done. You know, that's like a lot, and you know, all it takes is one of those, and then you might be shot for like a month. You know, so we'll see what happens. Anyone else? All right. Well, okay. Well, thanks, thanks guys. Again. Yeah, it was appreciate nice it. You all here. Yeah. <laughs> okay.